Okay. Welcome to the Ghosts of Plum Run Hour. I'm Tim Russo, uh, your host, author of the Star Wars series for leftists, Ghosts of Plum Run, and joining us today for a special discussion of the lockdown left and, and, and his autopsy of the lockdown left is Christian Perenni, professor at John Jay. Is that it, Christian? John Jay College, CUNY. It's part of the City University of New York system. City you University of New York. Fantastic. Master's program in heterodox economics, one of the uh, few programs in which you can study, you know, Keynesian, post-Keynesian and Marxist economics, because economics is a very, very conservative discipline. So I just want to get that plug in there. But yeah, John Jay College CUNY is part of the city university system. So uh, what caught my eye was you're, you, I've been waiting for somebody of any intellectual heft to write exactly what you just wrote. Um, and uh for our listeners, can you just quickly, uh, you know, tell people what you wrote about, you know, quickly summarize uh, your piece and uh, a little bit about uh, what you found in your writing, what you found in reaction to to this piece. And uh, I'll let you just uh, introduce everybody to, the, to to your thought process here. OK, yeah. Um, so the piece. uh you know, takes issue with the, the lockdown left's overreaction to COVID and to the whole society's overreaction to COVID. And I focus on the question of disease severity, uh, vaccine efficacy, and, uh, you know, the, the harm done by lockdown. And my theory, I present a theory of the crime. I try to explain why this happened. And my theory of the crime is fundamentally political, which is that, and it, you know, to be self-critical, it's a little American, probably too American centric. But my theory of the crime is that Trump derangement syndrome is at the heart of this. So beginning in 1976, you see this pandemic industrial complex emerging, right? The symbiotic relationship between the pharmaceutical industry and the regulators, the you know, public health agencies, CDC, NIH, right? There is an outbreak of the swine flu at a military base, and it seems that one or two soldiers have died of it. There's this massive overreaction. Um, a vaccine is rolled out. 20% of the U.S. population, including President Gerald Ford, are vaccinated before it is realized that, wait a minute, one, nobody might have died from this swine flu. It might not be as bad as we think. And two, the vaccine was causing Ghislaine Barr syndrome. It was causing this, you know, sometimes paralyzing and sometimes fatal autoimmune disease. Several hundred people died. Um, several thousand people alleged industries uh, injuries ensued the government and the vaccination campaign was suspended. You have from that time on, particularly in the early 80s, as austerity is, you know, the kind of work, the, the neoliberal turn is beginning, even under the Ford administration, right? The neoliberal turn has begun. There's been the kind of financial crisis in New York, and it's like various public agencies are on the chopping block. And so the public health agencies are struggling to maintain relevance, right? Because the other thing is that most infectious diseases had been at that point kind of wiped out in, in the global north. And so you see again and again with each, you know, viral outbreak, this this kind of like effort to gin things up. You know, most right. recently Zika, right? We're all terrified of Zika, and then it like you know it went away. And in all of these previous episodes, there was enough critical capacity in the political class, left and right, you know, and in the journalistic class to to push back a little bit and say like, well, wait a minute, like is the evidence really there to justify this, right? Even around AIDS, HIV, right? That um, Anthony Fauci was in the lead on this in his role at, at the uh, National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, you know, pushing this vaccine, 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 and being totally hostile to treatments. And people with HIV, people living with AIDS, and um, doctors were developing alternative modal modalities of treatment. They're saying, well, in the meantime, while you guys are working on vaccines, we've got to like do something for people who are suffering. And the position of the public health agencies was like, well, we know nothing about that. There's no proof. So we're not going to legitimize any of this. So your insurance companies aren't going to cover it. And it finally got to the point where actually Nancy Pelosi, of all people, calls out Fauci in a congressional uh, hearing. She says, well, if you had 
AIDS and you were suffering pneumonia, would you nebulize with whatever it was? Let's be, I forget the specific protocol. And he said, yeah, I would. And it, then it, it realized, everybody realized like, wait a minute, like this guy is, you know, he just admitted that he thinks what this alternative community of, of patients and healthcare providers is doing, he thinks it's legitimate, yet he won't use his power to justify it. His whole agency was threatened. He does a 180 for a couple of years and he becomes kind of, you know, friend of the um, alternative treatment community. Um, but then, you know, I mean, again and again, there's this attempt to hype it and there's, there's some pushback eventually and it just never really takes off. This time around, it got caught up in the election uh, struggle of 2020. And what happens is that it seems to me that both parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, decide to politicize this pandemic. And the Democrats are like, this time we've got Trump, right? After all of these times, the Hollywood access tape, this, that, the other thing, they're just like always crying wolf saying, we've got him this time, we've got him this time. And they realize, wait a minute, this time we've really got him. So the Democrats become very invested in, in hyping the danger of this. And Trump and the Republicans similarly essentially pick up the gauntlet, or maybe they're the ones who throw it down. They're like, you know what? We're going to own the reopening. The Democrats, they want to own the lockdown. That's going to be dangerous. That's going to hurt people and they're going to pay for it. So we're going to open the reopen. We're going to own the reopening. In, in other words, you know, March 10th, you've got Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York City saying, this disease is really not that serious. If you're under 50, you got nothing to worry about. Five days later, he's closing down the public schools of New York City, right? What's were going you, on? Were you in New York at the time? Yes, I was. So you, you, you're coming to us from where right now? I'm in Western Massachusetts. So you're in Western Massachusetts. And at the time of the, the, the outbreak, you were in New York. So you watched yeah. all that go down. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so you saw. Yeah. The but here, let, let me just finish this the political thing. So, so then Trump, Trump says, we're going to open the economy by April. The Democrats freak out and with them, the left. At the same time, um, the DeVos family connected foundation and other kind of like far right, you know, donors network foundations start funding. Um, well, it's mostly the DeVos family actually is funding this kind of campaign of protests at state capitals. And some yes, of these we had, we had that in Ohio. Ohio. We had that here in Ohio. We had them right. all at, in Columbus banging on the windows. <laughs> right. That was one of the other ones. Right. And so this is like this is red meat. To the Democrats, they're like, oh, my goodness, right, that famous zombie photograph, zombie-like photograph from Columbus, Ohio. So they just freak out. And so at that point, the whole thing is totally politicized. And simultaneous with that, in New York City, we had five field hospitals and we the had a, a military ship with a thousand beds or I think eleven hundred beds. The big boat. It. <laughs> None of these are used. Nobody went the, the headlines, the headlines are covered with these like, you know, deplorables marching on state capitals. Meanwhile, quietly, the field hospitals are being closed down and there's no public discussion of like, wait a minute, so what is the infection fatality rate of this disease? What's going on here? If we don't need these public hospitals, what does, not public hospitals, but if we don't need these field hospitals, what does that mean? No discussion because it was off to the races. It's like, we're gonna get Trump on this this one. Right. We've got I one agree with you on that, on that, uh, uh, on how the, you can basically put everything at the, at the feet of Hillary Clinton for the last 40 years, pretty much, um, maybe 50. Um, but I, well, I wanted maybe to, not everything, but I, I wanted to yeah. ask, ask, ask you, you're, you're, uh, would you describe yourself as a leftist? Yes, I would. I would and, describe myself as a leftist. Yeah. And, and specifically, how would that work? As are you Marxist? Are, are, I would you're describe myself as a Marxist. You're a Marxist. You don't have a neo in front of Marxist. No, classical. I would describe myself as a classical liberal and a classical Marxist. Okay. I am. Um, I I support civil liberties, and um, I I think the you know the classical critique of capitalism as offered by Marx is is really right on. Yeah. So have you noticed the the the, the portrait of August Willich behind me here. You see, the, the, do you know? I, 
Uh, he was a civil war, a Marxist civil war general. Yes, yeah. he, he was the guy. I, who... I couldn't tell that it's, I couldn't tell what it is, but, but yeah, that's great. Uh, also, uh, you're also Italian, which, uh, which, uh, are, how Italian well, are you? Italian American. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm half, I'm half Italian. Uh, my father's side of the family is, is uh, Italian. My, my grandparents were born in Italy. My mother's side of the family is like, you know, Scotch Irish, you know. Okay. So my, I'm half Italian, half Polish. Um, and uh, as, I don't know, do you guys still do the Easter thing on the Italian side? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, my grandparents passed away, but um, yeah, we did that. We did, we did the Easter stuff. The, so uh, Bona Pasqua. Bona Pasqua. Bona Pasqua. Yeah. Bona Pasqua. Yeah. Um, so in it, my, one of my things is to, is to start talking about food with Hold on one second. I got this puppy is freaking out here while, while here. you're going out with the puppy. I'm going to fill the, uh, I'm just going to let her out here. The, the time. <laughs> um, perfect timing to go into the food thing. So, um, yeah, there's a recipe that we have on the Italian side for a cookie called posteria have you ever heard of this posteria uh yeah i'm not that into sweets um okay so i couldn't id that cookie for you but it's a it's a it's like an anisette you know what anisette is yeah yeah, okay so you put white cookie small white cookie yeah nuts on it like uh pine nuts sometimes sometimes you put the nuts um in my family there were no nuts on the cookie but they take yeah. this cookie and they put it, an egg in it, a hard boiled egg in it. And they, they, they take the dough and they form a cross over the cookie and then they bake the cookie. Have you yeah. seen that? Yeah. yeah. You have, you have that. We call that a pastadilla in, 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 on my side. I don't know what you guys yeah. call it. I don't remember. I don't, I don't pay attention to the cookies. I remember I associate Easter with a kabut cell. Do you have a cell? What's that? Half, half a lamb's head. Uh, oh half, half a lamb's head is that what you're having at, at, at this east do you have that every easter no i no i wish no <laughs> whose recipe <laughs> that was, was that that was my one of the few things my grandfather would cook my grandmother would do the cooking otherwise but yeah kabutzel uh just grill it and eat it all and when you're you know when you're a kid that's pretty um it's pretty exciting you grill the lamb's head you br- broil it so you have like the tongue the brains the eyeball that's, cheek, it's really good it's really that's immigrant good. stuff right there yeah, that's some that's some ghetto guinea stuff <laughs> old, <laughs> old country southern italian stuff am i allowed to use the word dago in this podcast hey, it's between us man it's you between know, us so, it, but we can we can do it we can we can reclaim it you know? we're gonna reclaim dago we're gonna reclaim paisan uh so um your everyone knows your father is michael parenti yeah um how's he doing is he okay how's he doing He's doing all right. He's he's 88. Um, he's no longer writing and giving public lectures, um, but he's he lives on his own and um, he's in good health. He you know, he has mild dementia uh-huh. that is progressing very, very slowly. So I, I kind of don't think it's Alzheimer's. I, I think it is the effects of injuries from uh, a really vicious police beating. Oh, wow. During the early 70s, he was um, at a, this is actually a really touching and Italian story. He taught at Champlain Urbana and there it went there in 1970 or something. I think it was 70. Um, and I had just been born. He and my mother, uh, he and my mother were kind of like getting divorced as I was conceived. And, you know, then then he went off to this job and she didn't go with him. And at Champlain Urbana, this is like, you know, height of the Vietnam War, he makes friends with these two other Italian American guys, a professor named Phil Moranto, who has since passed away, and another who, who was a sociologist and, and a chemist, one of the leading chemists on lasers uh, named Rocco Lombardi. And these guys are both my godfathers. Oh, and wow. they made a pact that if the cops ever attacked one of them, the others and the others were there, the others would jump in and protect. Very Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and well, lo and behold, there's a little a little protest. Some students are blocking something, and there's, you know, and my dad just kind of went. He wasn't even involved in in organizing that, but he was very involved in organizing. But he was just stopped by the protest with our dog um, to check it out, and and he was attacked by the state troopers, 
and they were beating him mercilessly with clubs and Phil Maranto was there and Phil Maranto dived in and protected my father and took a lot of the beating for him. But my father was, you know, sm he had his skull open from that. Oh, and so, Jesus. And this was so over the war? Yeah, this was, you know, during the Vietnam War. I mean, I forget what the specific, actually, I think the specific protest had something actually to do with unionization on campus or something but you know it was it was part of the whole ferment of the 60s and the vietnam war right. was the backdrop but there was protests and organizing about all sorts of stuff and it was all you know connected into one great struggle and so. and you were raised uh he, he he gave you all of this leftist uh background right mm -hmm. yep as yep. you were growing raised. up I was raised as a red diaper baby of sorts. You're a yep. red diaper baby. Yep. One of the one of the last actual red diaper babies. So um, one, one of my one of my uh, uh, and my father was also, you know, my father was red baited out of academia. And so, you know, my childhood was like kind of bohemian mother who I mostly lived with. I also lived with my father on a couple occasions for, you know, half a year here, a couple months there. Um, and my, though my parents were divorced, they were very, um, there was no conflict over how to be parents and they were very collaborative about, um, about parenting. They didn't and this is in New York city, that. right? No, this was all over. And I was, I was mostly raised in, um, Vermont and Maine and Northern California. It was kind of a circuit that my mother and I did twice actually over the years. So I moved around a lot as a kid, I also lived in Cambridge, Mass., um, and my father was, you know, kicked around for years from different positions in academia and, um, you know, was was red baited as as was Phil Moranto and as was Rocco Lombardi. Rocco Lombardi had to actually leave chemistry for a while and became an anthropologist for a while. He actually wrote Carol Stacks, who wrote the famous book, All Our Kin, Rocco John Lombardi uh, actually wrote the afterwards and was involved in that field work. And then Lombardi managed to prove that the president at Champlain-Urbana was writing letters to universities that he would apply for jobs and threat telling them don't don't hire John Lombardi because he's a red. And so he got a good lawyer and the lawyer threatened the president and said, look, if you do this again, you know, we're going to sue you. And so the next job Lombardi applied for, he got it because he's a a great chemist. He's one, as I said, he's one of one of the leading experts on sort of um, lasers and how they interact with. And he's still materials. around. He's still with us today. Yeah. So I, I ran into one of these red baited professors at Midwestern Marks, this publication um, where I first ran into this COVID uh, left lockdown, left hysteria named Tom Riggins. Thomas Riggins was is is sort of like the. Um, the grand poobah of midwestern marks i don't know how but he's not from the midwest <laughs> but 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 uh um have you ever heard of tom riggins no. professor at nyu he 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 was red sort of red baited out of nyu um and uh this it's interesting to me your perspective because these communists in in uh in uh, intelligentsia, in, in in the academy, at, at universities, they seem to be right there with this lockdown left stuff. And when when you wrote that, my first thought was, are you having your tenure uh, threatened over this? What what is happening on your end? I may. I don't know. Not now, are yet, you vaccinated? I'm not vaccinated. Me neither. Uh, I I I have. <laughs> I have uh, naturally acquired immunity. I have a blood test that shows that I have robust antibodies and I have a doctor who's written a letter. So you've had, to you've had COVID before. I've had COVID. I, I mean, I, I think I've had COVID twice. So in March, um, hold on, here's the dog at the door. <laughs> uh, we, during this dog break uh, with uh, Christian Perenni's uh, puppy, uh, we will again. Uh, yeah, there he I'm is. Back. He's back. All right. So um, in March 2020, my whole family, my wife, myself, 
my mother who lives nearby, all came down with COVID-like symptoms. Um, there were no tests available. And my doctor said, well, you know, look, if you got this, that, the other thing, that I, I think you, have, you had COVID. And, um, and then I got COVID again in the Omicron wave. And that time, you know, took tests were available, took a test and, um, you know, tested positive and then got a blood test and had, you know, robust antibodies. So I definitely had it once, but, you know, the first time was much more the classic COVID. I had all the symptoms, including, um, you know, tightness of, of breath and mm -hmm. everything. So, so I think I had it twice, but I know I had it once. So you're refusing a vaccine mandate at John Jay University? Yes. And the, the vaccine mandate, the administration had settled into a test or a vax or test regime. And it was the union, um, you know, because of the hysterical overreaction of the most active members has actually pushed to eliminate the testing option. So it is my union that is doing this. And the union doesn't seem to realize that they could be threatening tenure if they're, and I, I've heard from some, one in particular, distinguished powerhouse um, professor at the Graduate Center you know, uh, of CUNY, who's totally opposed to this stuff too. I mean, what they don't realize is that if a, if a tenured professor sues and loses, that could open the door for, you know, a degradation of tenure. It, it basically reduces tenure to just another breakable contract. So the union, um, you know, is in my opinion, running around like a chicken with its head cut off. You talk and to your union rep on this? I talk to my union rep, yep. And she's totally, totally impervious to facts. Uh, I have wants emailed, she wants you I've, to take I've the vaccine. With the president of the union, you know, he's similar. Like so he says, well, when the CDC recognizes naturally acquired immunity, you know, then we would consider it. You know, uh, never mind that we just got a data a document dump from Pfizer showing that Pfizer, um, you know, recognized natural. So my, my my question on this union thing is that all these unions have proven themselves completely useless to the worker on this particular issue. Like they're, they're that fair, all of them, because some of them have been good. Some of the more industrial well, unions have like the flight attendants, you know, um, defended the, the a testing regime. And I think I think the industrial unions have been better than professional unions. Per, and even the postal many the, service, even many of the teachers union, my, my uh, mother in law is a unionized teacher in Kentucky and their union is not pushing this kind of stuff. They don't they don't have to get vaccinated. So and I think, I think the po postal service. Fair, there's certain locals. There's like. The, the local, the teachers locals around Boston, um, some Bay Area locals, a few of these locals are really like have been pushing school shutdowns and this kind of stuff. Um, you know, some of the. I'm pretty sure I, I don't know this for sure, but I think some of the um, SEIU locals, but actually, like, I think most unions have not gone in for the have not they're not doing what my union is. I'm not sure about that. I'd like to, I, I would love to see a, an analysis of 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 how uh, <clears throat> labor unions are handling this. For example, the NBPA just hung out Kyrie Irving to dry. And what's the NBPA? National Basketball Association. Oh. I mean, uh, Kyrie Irving uh, refused. The I'm sure you paid attention to the various. You haven't. Well, well, well no, I thought you were going to say what kind of Italian are you? You're not a sports fan. I'm not. Oh, Jesus. Well, oh, well, it's another problem with the left. They don't like sports. Like, give me a, a break. Sports, whatever. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so they, they, they hung Kyrie Irving out to dry. They hung out Aaron Rodgers, the NFL PA, hung out Aaron Rodgers to dry. Um, and, uh, you know, the only thing that's that, that, that defeated any of that was this individual player or individual worker uh, refusing it and, and taking the hit. I mean, uh, you must. I mean, you must have thought long and hard about writing this piece. Yeah, I did. I mean, I also. I wish I had published it earlier. I started it actually in the summer of 2020, but then um, my wife 
and I had a child. Well, she had a child. Ah, so, Guzalud. Yeah, thanks. And so, you know, that got in the way. And then I was also sort of like, you know, constantly thinking like everybody else was like, okay, well, this wave's over. That's got to be it. And it's like, oh, then another, oh, this, this got to be the end of it. And it's like, became clear this could potentially go on forever. And so then, yeah, I got around to it. So you found what made you decide? And also in, the, in the meantime, I got tenure. You know, it's like I had I had to go through the whole tenure process. So I just got tenure and stuff like that. So but who knows? I mean, yeah, they I mean, I, they may well they may well come after me. And uh, Did the and tenure thing be, affect your timing on that. Right. Yeah, I mean, and partly because I had to. I mean, partly was like. Consideration about doing it before getting tenure, but it was that was less important, actually than like the process of getting tenure, which was, you know, I mean, a lot of hoops you got to jump through. You have to create this right. huge dossier on yourself. You got to like get all these people to write letters for you. I mean, it's just like. And if you're you know, vocal about the vaccine, you might lose some of those letters. Yeah. Yeah. So. so and that but, that is a, a really important point in your piece, which <clears throat> um immediately got picked up i mean how did that work out did you approach gray zone did you part approach max blumenthal to say hey i want to yeah. write this um, well i mean it sort of began my wife marcy smith parenti wrote a piece about menstruation disruption which and is everywhere by the way like that's in my family like some somebody yeah. in my family suddenly just oh here it, it's back <laughs> like, yeah. like menopause postmenopausal women having yeah. their periods return um premenopausal women going into menopause uh, unbelievable this is like hem hem hemorrhagic, but hemor hemorrhagic style maybe not hemorrhagic but like you know month and six week long episodes of bleeding women passing golf ball sized clots this kind of stuff right yeah so this was happening in um my wife's family among the young women who all want to have kids they're all from the south from kentucky and um you know and it was getting no press anywhere. And uh, it was, you know, on TikTok among these younger women. And so Marcy wrote a piece about this. She started looking into it. She wrote a piece about it. And it was rejected by Jacobin. It was rejected by uh, The Intercept. It was, I forget where else. You know, it was rejected by all the places. And so, and she's friends with Anya, who is married to, to Max Blumenthal. And, and she, told Anya about this and Anya told Max and Max said, well, let, let me, let me see this. And so then he ran with it. And that was his first, that was his first, I think that was the first COVID piece. And he took a ton of grief for that, you know? Um, and Ben Norton, who was his, you know, his, his partner and all this like flipped out and, you know, tried to blow the whole thing up and split. Yeah. Um, well, that's what happened anyway, in Midwestern so that, March. So, it began, so, so um, I forget how we got on this, but like, it, you know, it began, the family endeavor around this began with that. And then the reaction to that piece was instructive. Total hostility, total denial, right? I mean, very intelligent people. Right. Who I think of as critical thinkers, just being like, I'm not interested. I'm not going to, you know, I won't consider what Marcy has written. Um, you know, I sent the the vanity fair article on the lab leak theory to a number of people three big famous left-leaning intellectuals told me that they were not going to read it because of its political implications it's remarkable that's, that's intellectual malpractice it's it's a level of ignorance which i can only ascribe to gramsci and cultural hegemony which is what i wrote about in 2020 when i like vaccine what so this this strikes me as a as a Gramscian moment, the whole thing. Common sense that that a lot of these guys really are capitalists. These 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 people who claim to be leftists uh, are acting like a capitalist uh, would in the face of the collapse of the system of governance, the collapse of their value system that Gramsci describes. You know, once it starts collapsing they all go into this uh, uh, defense mechanism. Um, and when I, when I wrote the piece that I wrote for Midwest Remarks in March of 20, May of 2020, this is before the mandates came out. It's like, listen, they're all going to make you do this. So here's how you say no. And I combined it with the Gandhian approach to nonviolence, which 
sort of is my thing. You know, you combine Gandhi and Gramsci and you get revolution. Um, and the reaction was the same as you described. Complete, total shutdown. Yeah. Uh, attacked on Facebook by uh, my own editors. Uh, and there was a fight. There, there was a fight over it. And I was like, listen, if you guys don't want to print this, fine. I'll print it at my own website. But, uh, you know, and, and nobody was paying me for any of this, by the way. This was all volunteership. Yeah. And um, the compromise was they changed the headline. The headline was how the working class can refuse the vaccine. The headline is now don't blame workers for vaccine skepticism. So they even used the capitalist word description of why you don't want to take this hot trash uh, and turned it around. And that started an, an, a, 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 about a three, four month long campaign to get me off the publication, which I'm now off. I've been off it now for a while. Um, but uh, how do you sorry, describe that? I mean, how, how do you how, how do you explain this reaction to these uh well, I'm not sure I have a, a, an adequate explanation, but I would explain it in, in a number of ways. First of all, most importantly, their enormous profits are being made off of this, right? The, um, the pharmaceutical industry is uh, indemnified against any injury that their vaccines may cause because of the emergency youth authorization under PREPA, which is a war on terror era law. So they're totally protected. The government buys all the shots. And, you know, Pfizer made a $22 billion profit last year. Profit. Right. Right. It's their business grew by 92%, right? So there is money being made hand over fist. And if you're invested in that, well, then you're, then you're, you know, you're, you're part, you're riding the gravy train. So there's a lot of material interest. There's also, um, I think just lots and lots of fear and anxiety in people because global capitalism is so kind of dangerously out of control and really feels like it's entering a kind of necrotic phase. I mean, it's like you know, spreading social breakdown in the global Time South. of monsters, as Gramsci would have described it. Yeah. Um, morbid phenomenon actually it, is the is the term yeah, the, the, the threat of climate change uh just you know the insect apocalypse and all sorts of environmental breakdown rising inequality there's tons of real increasing real risks none of which are properly discussed in the press people carry this anxiety so then there's this official discourse where you're allowed to cathect all your fear onto this one thing and so i think all this fear comes pouring out i think there's crucially a politics of respectability at play here that the professional classes are very concerned whether they know it or not with how they appear to other right. professionals this is something the working class doesn't suffer from <laughs> at least in the same way right. like they don't. what you think about <laughs> things i mean maybe it's sort of like wow this guy's <laughs> like this guy's lawn is a total mess can you believe that what what's up with him but like in terms of like you know having crazy ideas nominally crazy ideas it doesn't seem to me to to be as big a deal among the working class it's like no one would ever say like don't take your car to that mechanic he believes in uh you know the loch ness monster he's totally crazy like oh he's really good with um he's good with old cars but whoa don't don't let him talk to you about x y or z because he's really bonkers it just doesn't matter right yeah I, like, and i i, I sort of your, sense your ability to do your job not on what your attitude about this that or the other thing is yeah i i, I, I sort of sense the that the midwest thing like you guys are all in flyover country or we're in flyover country and you guys are on the coast and 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 this this uh this, this definitely afflicts the politics that you talked about with trump um uh, Trump derangement syndrome. I mean, the working class in the Midwest, and this is one of the reasons why I was so excited about this Midwestern Marx project, because it was coming from a working class Midwestern approach. You know, I live in Cleveland. I grew up in Cleveland. I'm from Cleveland. Um, and, uh, you know, that respectability thing. <laughs> if my uh, me mechanic fixes my brakes <laughs> for a good price, <laughs> I don't care how crazy he is. They can think I, whatever they want. Yeah. I, I, I really, I really, in fact, it makes him even more interesting to me. I like the guy even more, you know? Yeah. Um, but and, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. More um, importantly, you know, more importantly, it's like the mechanics standing in the community has 
almost no relationship to their ideas about things. It's about what they do, right? It's about the work. For the professional class, the people develop this highly attuned, though I think often kind of unconscious sensitivity to how they appear to others. And the politics of respectability right. is super important. And if you question any of the you know, policies around this, you question the vaccine safety or the vaccine efficacy, even in very, very reasonable, mild ways, you risk uh, being shunned and condemned as not modern enough, basically, you know, um, you be you, you, right. you risk being, you know, condemned as a. Well, the, op the, the opposite of that is you're buying a bunch of snake oil. Like what, what, what makes me makes me laugh about this the most is that America is is used to snake oil salesmen in, in medicine. I mean, the Amer American medicine used well, to be nothing but I mean, snake let, oil. Let, let's be let's be fair. I mean, maybe it's snake oil. Maybe it isn't. There does seem to be evidence that it helps the vaccines help reduce uh, hospitalization and death among the elderly. But the CDC won't release the data that it has collected on hospitalization rates by vaccination status and age for people below the age of 50. They don't release right? any of the hot data that would prove one way or another all of these questions. Yeah. And, you know, my, my position on the vaccine is like, if you want to take it, take it. But we know that it doesn't stop transmission. I mean, I, uh, um, Rochelle Walensky told this on August 5th of right. last year to Wolf Blitzer, right? Um, you Which know, was apparent the day they started talking about this. They're like, well, uh, it don't, it's not going to stop infection. And, 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 and they dealt with the transmission thing, but there was a term that was in the zeitgeist for a good hot minute called viral load. Remember the viral load discussion? Yeah, How yeah. Well, we don't hear about viral load anymore because it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything to the viral load. If you get it and you're vaccinated, your viral load is basically the same as yeah. an unvaccinated. So the pandemic approach to this, quote, vaccine is out the window at that point. Yeah. If you, if you can. And if there's you, no, I mean, the whole the whole logic of like herd immunity goes out the window, right? If, if the vaccine is non-sterilizing and, you know, leaky, then it's like you cannot achieve herd immunity, i.e. you cannot drive the disease to extinction, right. even if you vaccinate the entire population. And in fact, you make it worse. But yet worse. the left continues as if it's like this would all end if you if only you would all submit to this. Except, but there's no scientific basis to make that claim whatsoever. Not even the bought and paid for you know, right. Constantly spinning CDC says that. Right. And, and, and there's evidence that it's making it worse. And, and that, that brings me to, uh, have you, have you, who are you reading? Uh, what, what voices on this, uh, uh, on the reasonable COVID, uh, discussion are you listening to for example joe rogan and and robert malone did you pay attention to yeah. that at all yeah I, I paid attention to that yeah i mean i watched that interview yeah um have you i read very widely i mean you know whatever i read have you all have you heard of geert vanden bosch um geert's the belgian guy he's a belgian he's a belgian uh, uh virologist who but, uh no, i don't the name sounds familiar, but I can't I don't know what of his I read, but that does sound familiar. So in this but. constellation of 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 banned, canceled covid voices like Robert Malone and Steve Kirsch and and and, and Alex Berenson and uh, all of these guys is Geert Vandenbosch and Geert. Uh, and my my listeners know I pay, pay a lot of attention to Geert um, and and his analysis is that this is just making shit worse because it's a leaky vaccine the virus gets in anyway it sits in this uh environment of a vaccine that is not really a sterilizing vaccine all it's doing is failing to in to stop infection and therefore this vaccine then propagates uh mutations yeah which which then uh which respond to the vaccinal pressure and, and that's what Oma, and, and Omicron <clears throat> Omicron is a vaccine induced mutation. Yeah. And the next one is going to be worse. The next one after that is going to well, be the, worse. The Omicron is Omicron was, you know, mild. I mean, Omicron. Right. Was 
So the, the, I mean, the these... vaccine, the, 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 uh, the, the, the disease seems to be, the virus seems to be mutating generally in the direction that viruses mutate, which is towards less and less lethality. Except right? for so can... the vaccinal pressure. This pressure from the vaccine forces these mutations to escape the vaccine. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I have not followed this particularly closely. I'm aware of the, you know, the idea of, uh, adverse uh antibody dependent enhancement but it does i mean it doesn't seem like a lot of that is happening um not yet i i um, mean maybe i'm just sure. sidestepping it but like my 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 position on the, on the vaccine is like if you want to get it get it but i don't think people should be forced to get it particularly if they don't need it they've got naturally acquired immunity um and if they're at low risk you know they're young so um that is that's kind of where my focus has been on. And I don't get too into the weeds on all of the, the deep intricacies. Have, of, you, have you looked like, into the origin story of uh, <clears throat> EcoHealth and Peter Dayzak and all of them guys? Well, only, only through like reading the Vanity Fair articles, you know. So that Vanity Fair article appeared uh, uh, a, a year, a, a year and a half ago by someone else. Uh, who the Vanity Fair uh, author doesn't cite, but it's basically the same article that this other guy wrote. I forget what his name was. Nicholas uh, Wade. Yes, the, that's correct. Yeah. Nicholas but, Wade. But the, the Vanity Fair article, which was 12,000 words, came out like three weeks after. They, they were working on it simultaneously. And I read both of those. And um, uh, Catherine Eben's uh, Vanity Fair article is, I mean, it's, it's, it's much better than Nicholas Wade's um it's did you read that article yes i it's read them pretty, both pretty it, impressive there's there's a there's a lot of good information uh in both um uh, but the nicholas wade article was like a year and a half ago um no, but about, you, they, they came the out like within a month of each other really yeah i'm gonna have to fact check you on that i might have to yeah, get may i'm pretty sure it's may 2021 or is it May 2020? Well, this Vanity Fair article that just came out two weeks ago. Yeah, there's that, which is a follow-up. Which yeah. is a follow-up. Um, so maybe I'm getting my timeline wrong. But this stuff is out there. It's not like it's 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 it, it's uh it's it's totally being censored. They're trying, they're banned. This I'm pretty sure it was May 2021 is when the Vanity Fair and the Nicholas Wade article came out about the uh lab leak theory. And what is Kathy what is Nelson the what is the response to this lab leak theory with your union uh, and 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 the, the that doesn't, I, mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's not that's not necessarily pertinent to, you know, the workplace struggle. I mean, that's, I think, politically very important. Right. If if this vaccine, if this virus is the result of U.S. government funded gain of research, gain of function research, I mean, we we need to know that that's a totally legitimate concern. But that but in terms of like, you know, that having bearing on workplace policy, it doesn't. See, I think except in a, except in a sort of broad sense, I mean, no. Yeah, the no broad work, sense. No worker, no worker is going to like win their uh, vaccine exemption by arguing that this escaped from a lab that, you know, basically should not have been. No, it's yeah. Research. I mean. What I what I see that the origin story is is this Gramscian approach, which is this is the, the virus is a, is a production of capital. Yeah, well, and, and of particularly of neoliberal capital, right? Because it's like, I mean, there's a there's a letter in I think what is it like 2013 to the Obama administration, right? From a bunch of scientists, they say, hey, this gain of function research is dangerous. It doesn't really have that much utility. You know, it needs to be dealt with. And so the Obama administration basically shuts it down. But of course, there's like a little loophole about national defense or that. And then Anthony Fauci, um, you know, keeps funding EcoHealth Alliance and the gain of function research is moved from Barracks Laboratory in North Carolina over to Wuhan. And, and that the Wuhan lab, which um, you know, only recently becomes a biosecurity level four lab. It's like a, an open shop where there's all sorts of different contracts, like all sorts of different scientists and different agencies are doing all sorts of different stuff, i.e. it's totally chaotic. 
And I mean, according to the, the original Vanity Fair article, they kind of using the research of drastic, this kind of this network of you know open source researchers that were doing stuff like looking at satellite photos about uh, you know uh, traffic in hospital parking lots, translating Chinese documents. Right. Some guy, a, a school teacher in Kerala. I mean, who knows who this guy really is? Maybe he's Indian right. intelligence. Who the hell knows? But like some some retired school teacher in Kerala, India, with insomnia, spends his nights like running Chinese MA thesis titles through Google Incredible. translation and finds the MA thesis about the back. There it is. Virus. It's like <laughs> just kind of I mean, that kind of research is incredible. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. So then it's like, yeah, I mean, the this whole sort of like off the book subcontracting, that's so neoliberal. Right. And that's that's how this escapes. And I mean, in the Vanity Fair article, they even have it down to like they think that the way it escapes is that the level four section of the lab underwent some renovation and a refrigerator from level four section was moved into temporarily moved into a level three section and some grad student checked out some samples to look at i, I don't know well how. the theory I, I i heard early on was that, that bat lady the bat lady uh would not wear the level five suit like she was she was adamant four, i think or the, the highest four. level suit she wouldn't wear the highest level suit and so that's how it got out I could be wrong. Who knows? Uh, well, who knows check, how it got out? Check that Vanity Fair article. It's really, it's really impressive. So where do you think this ends up? COVID politics? I mean, I, my, I my, my thinking is this gets worse and worse because of these variants that keep coming out that, are, that, are, that have immune pressure put on them by the vaccine, and it just keeps getting worse. I don't think that's happening because I, I, don't, I don't see that. I think, I think that it's going to, you know, it's, that it is mutating into a less and less less lethal form and that the struggle now is to get the fanatics to let go of their secular secularized religious attachment to the rituals of lockdown and segregation and restriction and masking and all this sort of stuff i mean i think this i think the struggle is primarily at this point political and cultural around trying to pry the liberal establishment away from this and pry the lockdown left away from it. And, you know, good news is that that's happening to some extent. Germany just voted down vaccine mandate. Italy has finally ended its lockdown, I think only of, of uh, April 1st, you know. So more and more countries are going back to normal and accepting that we have to live with this. And so I think that's the struggles. We just have to. Um, China is yeah. still on zero COVID. Well, yeah. I mean, China's, you know, China is making all the mistakes. I mean, the mistakes sort of started in China. They shut it down. The West picked all that up. I think one, if I were to critique my own article, I'd say that the role of sort of imitating China is something that I didn't deal with in that article, which I think is an important part of kind of what happened, that there's a weird relationship to the Chinese model that, um, that in the West, even as China is condemned, um, that there's a certain kind of awe and envy because what China has done is totally incredible, right? Like this state-led mixed economy capitalist development that has raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty is staggering, right? There's tremendous, horrible environmental consequences that go with it, all sorts of class struggle as part of it, blah, blah, blah. But it's yeah. like, it's just, I mean... You cannot accuse the Chinese system of being unable to get things done. They get things done, right? And so as the West, as Western capitalism becomes increasingly kind of financialized, deindustrialized, bureaucratized, you know, necrotic hostage to these like dysfunctional tech platforms, there's a, a kind of growing envy, even among people who are critical of China, of, of the Chinese system's ability to simply execute things on a large scale. And so I think that that, you know, there was an element of imitation of these lockdowns unthinkingly. And so now China is dealing with it. I mean, and it's like horrendous, you know, uh, Max sent me a Twitter page. I'm not on, I'm not on social media, but he sent me his Twitter 
um, account that is, you know, it's, it's all of this, um, you know, cam phone footage of what lockdown is like in China. I mean, it's just insane. Like tens of thousands of people lining up at dawn. Like, you know, are they to ever going to go get, get over this? Let me finish. Let me finish. The, tens of thousands of people lining up at dawn to go get tested, which is like on the face of it. It's like, that's a great way to spread the virus. Right. right. There. A whole bunch of people sick. <laughs> you know, and then like, I mean, people being like people, people like going hungry in their buildings, hanging out red flags, banging their, their pots, like people attempting to leave these barricaded housing projects being attacked by the police. I mean, just like really dystopic. And it would seem to me unsustainable level. Yeah, of it suggests so, yeah, we'll that no vaccine is going to work, including the Chinese one. Um, and you, you're just going to have to suck it up. I mean, what it suggests is Trump was right all along from the very beginning about all this, which if you're in Ohio and you're me and you're work, you, you hang around Ohioans and working class people, you go, yeah, Trump was kind of right. But on in this uh, intellectual left discourse, to say Trump was right about anything is like you're right. uh, you're clearly an insane person, yeah. uh, if not a fascist who wants to kill me. Um, right. And it, 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 I, I do like your approach that, that this this Trump derangement syndrome, I, I, I sort of tie it much more broadly to the Clinton reform of the Democratic Party, which your father will certainly have experience with um, it, that uh, the Clinton uh, DLC centrist. A hijack of the Democratic Party away from the working class to these neoliberal that's capitalists. Also, that's not that's not incompatible with Trump derangement syndrome. I mean, that's their that's their brand is like sure. derangement. Russiagate, Trump. I'm saying you know, Trump derangement like, syndrome is a subset of this Clinton approach yeah. to the Democratic Party that 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 Trump comes along who who should have been predictable as 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 a symptom of the collapse of capitalism, as a symptom of the Democratic Party abandoning the working class to the Republican Party. Well, yeah, I mean, they're going to pick them up. I mean, when 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 Trump won, won in 2016, the hardest argument I had with people was about whether or not this was a Russiagate uh, hijacking of our democracy was, well, he won Ohio by eight points. Yeah. So if he win, if he wins Ohio by eight points, well, you know, he yeah, didn't I, he didn't have any. Right. There was no cheating here. OK, it, it, I, it, I wrote <laughs> I wrote an article uh, right after the election called listening to Trump that uh, you might be interested in. And it was, you know, I I I uh, started watching like the CNN. I'm not CNN, the C-SPAN rallies of Trump, you know, yeah. and it was to try and understand like, why is this guy so popular? Because if you just read the New York Times, the Washington Post, there was no reason that people should be gravitating to this dude. But if you went and watched what he said on C-SPAN, it made perfect sense. And what he was doing was he was not doing, his stump speech was not that disgusting, infamous speech about immigrants, right? His stump speech was an ersatz Bernie Sanders pitch. Oh, yeah. Right? And we found and that. I started the article. I started the article with a quote of his where he's in New Hampshire and he says, we're going to have factories that were in New Hampshire and went to Mexico, come back to New Hampshire. And when they do, you can tell them to go fuck themselves because they left and they let you down. And the crowd goes, bonkers and it's red you know? meat yeah I and mean, it's directly to people's material interests he's saying like i am going to bring the high paying jobs back and it, you know it's a promise he can't keep right uh, and, and he's a demagogue that's using yeah, and he had no intention of keeping it and he's also totally freaking incompetent and has add you know <laughs> no i mean really i mean an interesting thing in this whole covid thing was um like he really did not like that COVID task force, but he he was incapable of dealing with it. He brings in Scott Atlas. Scott Atlas, who's you know a right leaning doctor out of the Hoover Institute, was was there, and and the best Scott Atlas could do was basically get Trump to do some counter messaging. According to Scott Atlas's account, like Jared Kushner gets freaked out by the press coverage, and so Briggs and Fauci are like beaming out this fear mongering, and the press is picking it up, and then the governors are doing the lockdowns. And I mean, if Trump had been had more capacity, the ability to carry through and anything, he could have just been like, hey, you know what? We're redoing this. You guys are out of here. You got a new COVID task force or we're not having a COVID task force. Forget it. You know, but they like 
according to to Atlas, who's very pro Trump, so his criticisms are very mild and gentle. But you kind of read between the lines. It's like they didn't know what to do. Well, and now they he's kind of got freaked out about. They're like, wow, how, how, what? I mean, we can't just deny the reality of this. I mean, what what do we do? And they just like kind of froze. And now Trump is really in a bind because this is his vaccine. That that's what all these lockdown lefters forget. This is Trump's vaccine that you're shoving down everybody's veins. Okay. We have all those quotes, all those quotes. I mean, uh, the lockdown lefties probably don't remember it, but you and your audience probably will, right? You know, the quotes, Andrew Cuomo, governor of New York, then saying, well, we're going to test, you know, whatever these vaccines are, you know, whatever the federal government says, never mind, because New York state's going to also test them. And uh, Joanne Reed saying, like, why would you ever trust an FDA approved vaccine? Right. <laughs> right. Well, then, you know, once Biden wins, they're all in. So. So where are you going now? You're you're uh, are you teaching remotely? Is that why you're in? No, uh, mass? I, no I go down to New York. I drive down to New York and teach in person. Oh, really? OK, so you how long is that drive for you? It's like three hours and 20 minutes. You do that every week? No, I, I mean, I do it every week. Yeah. But I Damn. stay in New York. Yeah, it's brutal. But yeah, I mean, this gas people, prices I mean, must lot, be killing a you. Commute, a lot of people commute just as much. I think my commute is basically the average American commute. But I just do it in two chunks as opposed to like, you know, basically 10 little pieces. Oh, my God. So you live down. You live for a week in new york so like part of the week, like yeah part of the week because you can do a lot of work from home grading papers talking to people on the phone stuff like that but go down for three days a week come back that kind and, of thing and the gas prices must just be murder on you right now yeah yeah they're um so they're where are you going high. with the, what's your next move are you going to go on uh lockdown left tour you, um jimmy Dore, max blumenthal well, next stop joe rogan I don't know. It's not up to me. You know, I don't I don't decide what well, you said. People are coming and giving you uh, kudos for this. Right. Other than. Yeah, I've received a lot of emails. I mean, I have received, uh, you know, uh, far more emails for, for this in reaction to this piece than anything I've ever written. And they're you know, typically it's like I mean, it's people from all over the world, academics from Europe, from India. Um, and it's a lot of them are like you know, lefties who are like, I, I can't, I don't understand this. I can't believe how deranged things have become. And then telling stories of like, you know, I had to break up with a close friend when she called yeah. the cops on working class, her working class neighbors who were socializing on the stoop unmasked. And like, you know, you know, some guy from the Alvin Ailey dance company worked there for 30 years, was fired for not taking the vaccine, you know, some, a librarian from this or that place who's like got a naturally acquired immunity fired. I mean, it's people that's like, and they're all just kind of like, they're all lefties and like, what has happened? They're what not is lefties going on here. They're not lefties is what the issue is. I, I've decided that they're all capitalists at heart and that's, and they're having a Gramscian cognitive dissonance reaction over this, uh, which is, which dates back well before COVID. I and, think there's, yeah. And, 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 and what, and, also, and this, this derangement that you're, that you're describing is, 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 is a cognitive dissonance, uh, defense of the value system of capital. That's what's going on. I have, be. I, I have been I waiting for that, someone but, of greater import than myself to make that argument, but, uh, I haven't heard it yet. <laughs> perhaps, well, you're, perhaps you're, you're you'll doing find it, one. You're doing it, so that's good. <laughs> I mean, I think also there's a, you know, there's a psychological thing here, which is that, um, it gives vent to just sort of like libidinal energies. It's just a kind of like sadomasochistic um, perfect storm. You know, right. you get the pleasure of submitting, the pleasure of submission, following the rules, wearing the masks, all the rituals, and the pleasure of aggression and domination, condemning the unvaxxed, excluding people, dominating, right? It's like, it's perfect. And so, I mean, cause there's, there's something non-rational going on here as well. I mean, you're suggesting something that might be semi-conscious, kind of unconscious, but fundamentally sort of rational, political, rooted in interest. But there is also something that's just purely sort of psychological. I mean, people are cathected to this. They are, there is some sort of pleasure, even as they are on the face of it, unhappy and suffering and worried. They are so invested in this, it's obvious that they're getting something out of this. It's an authoritarian they feel vital, impulse. They feel connected. It, it, it's like they feel, you know, the catharsis 
of submitting and also dominating. It's, I think that's what you're describing there is powerlessness that needs an authoritarian impulse to impose order. Um, that, 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 that there is a, there is an author, authoritarian impulse in a capitalist that says, no, you're doing yeah. it my way. Right. Uh, which is rooted in a powerlessness of somebody who is, who, who, who is invested in a value system, which it doesn't, uh, doesn't help them. That doesn't work. Uh, and, and, and capitalist, especially neoliberal capitalism, as you, as you uh, point out, is apparently not working in so many ways that this powerlessness takes over and then you really need this authoritarian impulse to, to give you that pleasure of power of control you everything's out of control but you yep. can impose some control on Kyrie Irving and Aaron Rodgers and Novak Djokovic and all of these people and Christian Perenni and his and his tenure ha ha we're gonna get him um yeah. you can impose control and also you can be un you can also be unburdened of having to face your powerlessness by just submitting and being like, you know, there is adult supervision. Yes. I am protected. Right. As opposed to, you know, the real, the reality of global capitalism is, you know, there is no adult supervision. I had an epiphany about the ruling class once when I was, you know, back for about 10 years, I was a, you know, a conflict reporter mostly and, and did a bunch of traveling. And I was coming out of Iraq one time and uh, things got messed up. It was the only time I flew business class. And, uh, I had a layover in Stippel in Amsterdam, you know, and I'd been in Iraq for like, you know, weeks and weeks. And it was just like, oh, so nice to be in this nice environment and, and get, so went into the first class lounge and, you know, it was just like all this free food and booze and espresso and sparkling water. It's like, this is leather chairs. I was like, this is fantastic. I think I've been in that. And then, <laughs> and then I like look up at the television and it's like, the same idiotic nonsense. It's CNN, you know, and, and I realized I was like, whoa, like the food and drink is better and it's comfortable and nicer. But intellectually, the elite are fed the same slop that everybody else is, you know, and yes, there are, you know, private transcripts in boardrooms and this and that, but it's like, by and large, you know, the massive elites, like they just consume the same garbage that they feed to everyone else. And so as if, if we think that like elites really have like better ideas, but they're more nefarious, some of them do, but a lot of them are just dumb, right? And uh, in other words, there is no, there is no adult supervision, right? There's, there's no plan for dealing with all this stuff. It is out of control. And I mean, I think that the ruling class is affected by the larger society it produces. That deindustrialization and financialization leads to a kind of financialization and, and a dematerialization of the ruling class imagination, right? Say what you will about industrial captains of industry, but they dealt with material questions like, is there enough steel? How long does it take to get it from here to there? Right. <clears throat> when the ruling class becomes purely financialized, they start thinking stuff like, no, 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 the, there are no problems. You just move the money from column A to column right, B. Right. If, if asset A has a problem, divest and move into asset B. But that's not how the real world is, right? So they have this sense of limitlessness and it's like they become increasingly out of touch and not capable of dealing with material and political reality. Well, I appreciate so your time. Rot, in other words, the rot of this system affects the ruling class also. Right. And that that's really the one thing that scares them the most is that this this when once the rot reaches the ruling class, like through covid. Um, where it, there's no defense against this one, uh, doesn't matter how powerful you are. Um, yeah, it's going to freak them out. And I think that freak out is ongoing and going to last for a very long time. And I, I do. Yeah. I do and, appreciate, and, and our, appreciate and, you talking about it. Yeah, and I think it's going to last for a long time unless we push back. Also, because it's a very effective form of rule, right? The ruling class right. is always trying to make its class rule, its domination as a class, make that look like it's something purely technical, totally antiseptic, apolitical, right? That's always what the ruling class does. And 
you know, this COVID discourse is fantastic for those purposes. It's much better than the war on drugs, much better than the war on terror, right? Most people accept it. They, they accept what is domination, increased domination by the 1%. They accept it as right. something apolitical. It's, it's merely technical here. You know, you're overthinking it. If you, if, you, if, you, if you import politics into this, you're wrong. No, that's what makes it such an effective system of social control. Well, here we are in solidarity. Thank you for writing that piece. Um, it's a pleasure meeting you. Give my best to your family. Bona Pasqua. Bona Pasqua. Um, thank you. For, and uh, thank you for if, let, send me anything you think I should have a look at. I really appreciate your perspective. OK, thank you very much. I will. And, and you as well. Please send me things that you think are, are worth reading. Thanks, Professor. I appreciate your time. All right. Take care. Bye.